Good morning. Good morning, good day. And welcome to those of you that are here and those of you that are joining us from around the world, wherever you are tuning in from at this time. It's good to have you doing so. And that good is not because of the amount of viewers that we are getting that matters. That, that, that's not what makes it good. It's not because you even choose to come on why it's good, but because of God and what God is about. Because outside of God, good is not guaranteed. Outside of God, most things that we call good, it's bogus. It's not true. It's false. But where God is concerned, and we truly come to know who he is, the scripture tells us in James chapter 1 that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, with whom we have to deal with. When Jesus was here, Christ in the body of Jesus, he was approached by a man, one of the gospel referred to him as a rich man, another as a lawyer, and so on. And he approached Jesus and he said, Good master, what must I do to be Save. Jesus said, why call me good? There is only one that is good, and that is God. Many people, even in church, it has become a cliche. It has become a, a religious saying. God is good all the time. God is good. Garbage. I do not participate when I go anywhere and I do that. Because many people are talking about God is good and we're not experiencing the goodness of God. Because number one, we're walking in disobedience. Our, our complete life is a lie. And a liar cannot experience the goodness of God. In the power that it is meant for us to experience it. A liar. If God does that and continue to allow you to experience his goodness... Why would you need to repent? Why would you need to change? And so, I want to explain what I mean that that's not coming from a religious place. It's coming from a place of understanding, a place of truth, and a place that is meant to honor God. Not you. Honor God. I don't live my life to please you. Any thing from my life that is pleasing to you, it's because I'm first committed to God. I don't live for you. I live for God. And if you're of God, you will see something in me. And I hope that you're able to see it to the point where it inspires and encourage you to want it. Because the Apostle Paul says, those whom God has chosen to be in leadership where the church is concerned... They're not just supposed to lead like anybody else leading. They're supposed to lead in full representation of Christ. That they can say to those whom they're leading, follow me as I follow Christ. Christ is the pattern. So as we come together in this room and you come together around your television or your computer, wherever you are watching from, those of you listening by radio, I really pray that it will not be a moment of religion. There's a lot of people who still come in this building, in this room, and they're religious and they have no intention to change. I can't do anything about it in this room and I can't do anything about it from where you're concerned watching online. It comes down to a desire for the living God. Not a desire for a building. Not a desire to go to church. But a desire for God. A desire for God. And when you have a desire for the living God, it's impossible for you not to change. 
You don't remain a Trini. You don't remain a, a Bayesian. You don't remain a Jamaican. You don't remain an, a, an American. You don't remain a Canadian when you come to Christ. Because in Christ, there is neither Greek, there is neither Jew, there is neither male, there is neither female, there is neither bond nor free. You, it, when you come to Christ, everything that you were connected to before, you have now been delivered from that. So even a lot of you as females who love your femaleness, just like many males who love their maleness and refuse to give it up and say that they are of Christ, you are a liar, you are an hypocrite. When you come to faith in Christ, those things must be under your control to the point that you know when you're supposed to be a male. You know when you're supposed to be a female. You know when you give permission to your emotions. Jesus, after the resurrection, and he appeared to the disciples, and all of them didn't see him at the same time. But then eventually it got to the point where he appeared to all of them. And when he rose from the dead and the first persons to see him after the resurrection was Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast seven devils, seven demons. And... Uh, when she saw him, and you, in John, John told us that she was so excited after she recognized at first she didn't recognize that it was him. And that is even evidence that when we go to be with the Lord, we will not remember no relative. For God's sake, why do you want to hold on to that? We're not going to remember nothing because all of this is temporary and men to tell a story while time as we know it exists. So when this age wrap up, it will not be of any value or importance. You're not going to have no picture with you. Because you're not allowed to take no phone with you. Your iCloud storage will, not, it will be of no matter. You think you're going to be there swiping and looking, oh, I wish grandma was here. When Jesus rose from the dead and Mary saw him, at first she didn't know it was him. Until he mentioned her name. You remember? She saw him and thought he was what? The gardener. And Jesus also went on the road to Emmaus with two of the disciples. And they didn't recognize him until when he broke the bread. And he just and disappeared out of their sight. In that moment, in that stage, we're going to know each other the way we ought to. Spirit, purely spirit. So what we're going to see each other as is not male and female, uncle, auntie, cousin, wife, brother. So even families, families, because you, you, you have it. We see it even in the scripture. We have family, complete family that is born again. You're not going to know each other as family from the earth realm. You're going to see each other as sons of God. Purely sons of God. You have never heard any preacher say that because these dumb preachers giving you false hope. Oh, when you go to heaven, you know, you're going to remember your loved ones and, and your loved ones will be waiting there to greet you. Waiting for me. They have even sung. They're waiting for me. My loved ones are waiting for me. It's not scriptural.
So what's the man you go do when you go up there? When, when, I keep talking about when you go up there. When, 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 when Jesus returns and you're with him and you realize that your granny that you love so much and you have a lot of Christmas memories with her and all of this stuff and she's not there. We're going to leave. You're going to leave, right? And it needs to be told now because we have this false hope. And I'm teaching on truth. Truth must replace lies that have been told to us in Sunday schools. It is very sad that a lot of the lies that has occupied our minds, it came out of what we call church. It came out of what we call church. Jesus, when he saw, when Mary, after he mentioned her name, she said, Rabboni. And she's running to touch him. He said, do not touch me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. As the high priest who had to offer up a sacrifice. And the sacrifice that he was offering up was not a sacrifice apart from himself. He was the sacrifice. He is the high priest, and he is the sacrifice. Wow. He said, touch me not, because I've not yet ascended to the Father to complete the sacrifice. And the sacrifice cannot be contaminated. When he appeared the second time, by now we know that he had gone, he had completed it. And he appeared to the disciples. He told her to go and tell Peter, too, that he was alive. Peter told the other disciples that he was going back to fishing because it's something that he loves. You say you love God, but is it true or is it a lie? Because God says, if you love me, the proof of it for yourself and to others is that you keep my word. You keep my word. You don't run off your mouth. You keep my word. And when they came in, after we know that they spent all night toiling and caught nothing. Boy, I'm looking forward to fasting. Those of you that have never thought about even coming to fasting because some of you don't see the need for it, make the time to be in the fasting meeting and the next few fasting meetings after this because I'm going to start a teaching. Whew. And if you're not going to be here, if you say that you're a part of this ministry, take the time to go on the channel and watch it. It is that important because it's going to help you to escape the pull of the beast system that is already emerging on the earth. Because God is not using me to entertain you. He's using me to prepare a people for his return. John the Baptist came to prepare the way for him to come. I'm not the only one, but I'm like that. Jesus said, after they were coming in and he told them to cast the net on the right hand side and they catch... 153, 153 large fish. They had never catch so many fish on their own. But when you receive the instruction from God and obey it, it's going to look like God. And they came and they're taking the fish out and, and Peter is excited. And right in that moment, Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? More than these. Females, you love your emotions more than you love God. And many of you sit in front of me for years and you still lock into your emotions and you're, you're dealing with things from your emotions. You want things to soothe your emotions. What are you doing? And say that you are of God. It shows that you reject that you are even a son of God. 
Because as a son of God, you are neither male nor female. I know when to use my maleness. I know when it's of any importance. And you as a female must know when you permit your emotions. Because in Christ and Christ in you, you first rule over yourself before you, real, you, before you rule over demon. You notice many of you have been in church for years and you have never cast out a demon? Never. And one of the reasons why you have no authority to cast out a demon, you have no authority over yourself. Paul says, I die daily. And notice, I bring my body under subjection. I bring it. With Christ in me, you have the authority to do it. Your body not supposed to rule you. That's the default state of the fall of man. So once you're restored to Christ, the spirit rules. Walk in the spirit and you will not what? Fulfill the lust of the flesh. Some of you love things that you are not supposed to be in love with. And the question that Jesus asked Peter, men and women in this room and those of you that are watching, I'm asking you, what do you really love? Or who are you really in love with? And that's why a lot of you come inside here, and just like all you come in, that's how you leave. Sunday, it was Sunday gone, when I opened the door and I called one person, because that's the person the Holy Spirit told me to call. And I did the demonstration with the person where this piece of metal thing is. I think they, this is called a, a transitional strip. So you have metal, you have wood and other material. So where the transitional strip is right here, it's right at the threshold of the door that when you come in and you come inside here, you step over this, you step into the room. Here, you're not in the room. That's how it's set up. When you go even to your house, you go to that front door, you're on the porch, you're not inside the house. Until you step in and cross over that. And the Holy Spirit used me to demonstrate that. And what I'm saying, I watched some of you come, come cross over. Nothing happened for you. And why it will not even happen for you? Because in the first place, you are a liar. You are an hypocrite. And no matter how you step over that, come, come, step over it again. Nothing will shift until you repent and let truth Govern your life. Many of us think that liars are only persons who speak it. <laughs> You're living a lie that who I am seeing beside me, that's not who you are. You come inside here and you put on the Sunday morning face. And many of you think that is church I need to go. Because if you go to church, you think that's going to save you? If the Lord Jesus Christ should come right now and the angels and the Holy Spirit begin to gather his people, some per person would remain in this room. They wouldn't even realize that you are taken out until long after. Because the Holy Spirit will not take them. Because in the first place, some of them are not even born again. They're pretending that they are and they're not. This is not a joke, people. And every God Almighty day and up and moment that God allow me to stand in front of you, it is not a joke. It's a moment of warning and for you to wake up because you're so deep in sleep that you can't even hear me. And some of you that are hearing me, you don't care about what I'm saying because you, are, you have convinced yourself that you even know more than me. If you know more than me, what are you doing in the room? Tomorrow morning, the students that will be in this room, they're not coming inside here thinking they know more than lecturer. They're coming in 
with a desire to learn whatever it is that they're pursuing. They're expecting that that lecturer, that lecturer who have already studied and got their masters or their PhD or whatever. So now this person is at a level that they can impart certain knowledge to me that I need in the field that I'm pursuing. And I've watched, especially men, I've watched a lot of them come in here. Even some of you watching online. And you, 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 you come in here with the attitude of mine that you know more than me. So what I'm saying, it doesn't matter to you. And whatever I say, you take it and you turn it around and you filter it through yourself. I'm not going to take back nothing that the Holy Spirit said to me a while ago. And I'm not going to apologize for nothing. It's already gone out there, and if you don't change, it will come back on the day of judgment to be a part of the judgment that God will hand down. You will have no excuse to say, I did not know. Because I do not hold back anything that the Holy Spirit wants me to say. Because if I hold it back, your blood will be required on my shoulder. I will carry nobody's blood. So the Holy Spirit chose to start off like that. So be it. So be it. So be it. In Luke chapter 11. Verse 1. Now it came to pass... As he was praying, praying, praying. That's another thing that we're in love with. We need to check ourselves, you know. You know that there are people who are in love with love? <laughs> you need to check yourself. We're not supposed to be in love with things that is meant... For us to use it to put God on display. It's God that you're supposed to love. And one another. And what does that love look like? When you say that God loves you, do you think that God feel? Do you think that God feel? Love for you? No, he doesn't. He is spirit. So the love of God is based on the principle of who God is. God is love. So whatever God does out of who he is, that's coming out of love. So it starts with how God view you. How, what he wills towards you and that's how we are supposed to love one another how do we see each other what is supposed to value who we are or who is supposed to value who we are so the scripture says it said it's the scripture says brethren if he laid down his life for us Showing his love for us. So ought we to lay down our life for one another. And you notice, it's only when I talk about love, some people will do it for a week. And then as soon as the week over, they're gone back into their old mongoose raccoon behavior. If you notice, it's when I say certain things here, some people will, you know, all of a sudden we just get into it. It, it, it. The word is supposed to become flesh. That it's establishing you. And even when you're not in my presence and you're not seeing me and I'm not seeing you, it continues to be who you are. You think I only show you love in front of you? And then behind you, I tear you down. I do all kind of stuff and then come in front of you and skin my teeth like I'm with you. 
And in my heart, I'm not with you. The scripture said we're supposed to love one another fervently. Your love for each other is supposed to be blazing. The word fervent, it's a zeal. It's a strong desire. And that kind of love, it, you, you don't even think. There's not a second thought. You lay down your life. That's the love that God displayed towards us. Who inside here? The love in you is burning for the other, for the brother, for the sister. Come on, there's a lot of hypocritical love in the room. Hypocritical love in the room. And other rooms. We're religious in our love. I, I love you with the love of the Lord. Man, I was so offended and upset when anybody said that to me. I said, don't you tell me that. That's a religious statement. I love you with the love of the Lord. They said it, but it was nowhere to be found. We're in love with prior. And we need to change the relationship. Prior is given to you for you to use it. To experience the living God. You're not supposed to be in love with it. You notice when God told Moses to build the serpent. After Israel had rebelled against God. And God sent the serpents among them as a form of judgment. And many of them died. And Moses went to God and God said this is what you need to do to save them. Which it became a type and shadow of the cross. God said build a bronze pole. Build a bronze serpent, put the serpent on there. As Moses lift up the serpent, even so the Son of Man will be lifted up. You remember? So it wasn't just done for just, you know, whatever. But the scripture said, whoever looked upon it, if they were bitten, they would live. Sin bite you, you looked up Jesus, you would live. You remember? After a while, they started worshiping the pole with the bronze serpent. Have you read it in the scripture? Yes, they did. God told them, Mo Moses to build a tabernacle. And from the tabernacle, we got to the temple. After a while, you get to Jeremiah chapter 7, and the people were in love with the temple. The temple, the temple, the temple of the Lord. Let us go up to the temple. Let us go to worship. And we're in love with Things we do, we're in love with music, we're in love with our gifts, we're in love with our talents, we're, we're in love. But God, we don't love. And each other, we don't love. Church in Ephesus, in the book of Revelation, we're going to read that in a, in a little bit here. The first church that the letter reached, because the seven churches, based on the geographical structure, Ephesus was the first. And remember, Jesus commended them. You see, in each of the letters, there is a commendation, and then there is a rebuke, an instruction on what to do to correct whatever mistake is there. He said to the church in Ephesus, I've seen your work. I've seen how you have even tested those who say that they're apostles and found them to be liars. I've seen that. Wow, isn't that good? But he said, I have something against you. Don't sleep. I have something against you. What is that? You have left your first love. We're guilty of that in this room. You've left your first love for God and your first love for each other. Remember when we just, even many, you remember when you just came in? And then certain things happen. And as a result of that, Jesus even said in the latter days, because evil abound, the love of many wax cold. Many of you came in here and how you came in here, that's not how you are right now. So you're not even growing. You're not changing. And because you have, you have met some 
bumps along the way, there's a few patholes. All of a sudden, you start to reserve your love. Me? Me? No, sir. I, I don't want nobody to hurt me again. That's why you need to let go of your emotions. When you are spirit, it's difficult for people to hurt you. Jesus did not hold on to his emotion because if he did, he would come back and go and look for the centurion. If Jesus had held on to his emotion, he would come back and look for the one who punched him in his face. He would come back and go and look for the one who smite him, spit in his face. But he, on the cross, he let go of everything and he said, Father, forgive them. Because they don't know what they're doing. I have something against you. You have left your first love. And you remember what the instruction was? Repent and do the first work over. Remember how you used to love? Repent and do it again. Repent and do the first work over. And he, remember, the instruction continued. He said, if you refuse to repent, I am going to come and I'm going to remove your candlestick. Remember what the candlestick represents in chapter 1? The candlestick represents the seven churches. So if he's going to remove the candlestick, it means that he's going to remove them out of existence. Jesus was praying in a certain place when he ceased. One of his disciples said to him, Lord... Teach us, teach us, teach us, teach us, teach us, teach us to pray. As, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, whenever a moment arises that you need to communicate with your father, you must keep this in mind. It must, it, it must be a natural part of you that the moment you think about God, you're seeing an image, the word image, the image. The image that you have of God is not a photo. The image is word. The image is word. So when you image God, you must see the word F-A-T-H-E-R. Because even in the natural, when you think about things, it's not really a photo that comes to your mind. You hear the word, and whatever is associated with that word, you image it, you connect it to that. Everywhere in the scripture... I came into this so long ago, and boy, it has changed my life. From Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God. When I read that, I don't just see the word G-O-D. I see the words, the word F-A-T-H-E-R. That was what's in the mind of Jesus. That was what was in the mind of the apostles once they came into full maturity. That's why they could go. And if you notice, every single one of the apostles that write to the church, notice how they start their letter. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. From who? God the Father. It became a part of their thinking, their life. They lived it out in front of the saints. And many of you, I have been saying this for years, and it hasn't touched you because you think I'm making it up. That's what the Bible is about. That's the beginning of time, and that will be the end of time. And eternity will swallow up time, and we will continue in eternity seeing God as Father and seeing ourselves as sons, not granny, not uncle, not whatever, sons. Question, because some of you are still refuting it. How does the angels see themselves? Hmm? 
spirit. Because they are spirit. <laughs> and if you're going to worship God in spirit, you have to see yourself as spirit and God as spirit. So a lot of the worship going on, it's false. It's only meant to entertain those who are participating. But it's not giving God any worth. Because they're not seeing God the way they should. Our Father in heaven. Some of you don't, not, you don't know where your earthly father is. I saw this, this um, I think it's CBC, did this, this thing. And... Um, these two ladies, they knew each other for over 20 years and became good friends. And then they found out that they're sisters. The other one wanted to know where she came from and started to do a search. And she did the, the ancestry thing and all of a sudden it, it, it she said she used two two and and it started to go and go and go and when she went to this thing and look at it and see the name and then when she see that she said um am i dreaming or something so she called the, the friend the friend and she said who, who who is your father because she lived with the father but this one did not live with the father they're white it's not only black people fatherless. No, it's not a black curse. It's a human curse. Starting from the garden. And so therefore, when we get born again, now we come into it. Because you notice, which preacher you're teaching to bring God's people into that understanding? And then the, the dumb Seventh-day Adventist people and the law people making it even worse. Because you cannot pursue the law and find God as Father. You cannot pursue the law. The law rob you of seeing God as Father. You will never see God. So you don't hear Seventh-day Adventists teaching about God being Father. The law was a tutor. A governor until, until, until you dumb preacher that have PhD, you're, you're a PhD and you're dumb because you don't even understand what the word until means. And I didn't go to school. I don't have no PhD, but I understand what it means. Until Christ came. So when Christ came, because if you leave your child with a tutor or a governor or a, or a babysitter, you don't leave the child with a babysitter for life. So when the time comes, you go and you get your child. You leave your child with a babysitter sometime for a few hours. Six hours, seven hours, eight hours. But the intent is that you're going to go back to collect your child. The law was babysitting us. Until Christ came. And when Christ came, hallelujah, he came in and he says, I'm here to get some sons. Mm. There is a, there, 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 there's an expectation, there is a desire, there is a destiny. So as many as receive him. As many as receive him, as many as receive him, as many as... We, so when he come to collect you and you run to him and receive him, as many as receive him. To them, the father gave the right to become Catholics, Methodists, Baptists, Anglican, Presbyterian, Moravian, name it. He gave them the right to be... So you have a right to be a son of God. Do not be nothing for no man. Be what God has purpose and destined you to be. 
you have a choice. Stand with me, please. It is the most beautiful thing that can ever happen to a human being. Seeing God as Father. Let me say it again. It is the most beautiful thing that can ever happen to a human. You have known what beauty is until you see God. As father. There's a song that says, You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, my God. I came in this morning, and even while I was packing out my stuff here, I, in, my, in my spirit, in my heart as a father, may everyone coming in this room who truly belongs to you today, may we get a revelation. May we all receive a revelation. I mean, a revelation that it's impossible for you to ever go back to what previously. Peter got a revelation. That Jesus was the Son of God. And even though he could not avoid denying Christ, Sister Kim, Jesus said to him, Peter, Satan desired to see you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. And when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. And Jesus said, before the cock crow, you're saying that you're going to die with me, you're willing to die, but no, 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 this is going to happen. You're going to be tested. But there was this thing inside of him, Marcella, the revelation was so powerful that even though in the moment he did it, you remember when the cockerel and the scripture said, he remember what Jesus said to him. Why do you think Peter weeping the way that he wept? It's not just about what Jesus said that this would have happened. It's that he had the revelation that he was. So even though his lips denied him, his spirit was already loaded with that revelation. He went out and wept bitterly. And so when Jesus rose from the dead and Jesus said to Mary, go and tell my disciples that I'm alive. And notice, he further, he further went and tell Peter to. And God was the one who gave him the revelation. Father, Reveal yourself to me. Reveal yourself to us. We need to see you. We need to see you. As Moses said, show me your glory. Jesus said, the glory that my father gave to me, I have given it unto you. Father, show us your glory. Go ahead and talk to him. Go ahead and talk to him. Go ahead and talk to him. Don't just talk to God. Talk to Daddy. Talk to Papa. Talk to Father. Talk to him. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for this privilege. Thank you for this opportunity to come to be in this room one more time. One more time. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for your people that you have allowed to be in this room. We've journeyed from different places, different distances, and you protect us along the path to allow us to come together in this room. Not for a mere social gathering, not for whatever the, the, the we see going on in what we call church today. Because our churches, Father, whatever they call church today, it is, it, is, it is designed to give convenience and comfort to people. Father, there are places where people go and they get their coffee and they come in the meeting with it. There are places where people go and they get whatever they want to get and they come in the meeting and they're being entertained. And Father, we, are, we, we, we have the stage set where the entertainers come up and they're entertaining. Father, there are places where they even have comedians. They call 
call them Christian comedians, Father. And they come in and they're entertaining people for people to laugh because they say, oh, we're living in stressful time. People need to laugh. Oh, God, forgive us. Father, forgive us. But this place, Lord, this place, this place, because I am here, Lord, you know that you can trust me, that I'm not going to entertain your people. I am going to edify your people. I am going to strengthen your people. I'm going to build up your people. Build them up in you. Build them up in your son. Build them up in truth. Because, Father, only when we know the truth, we are truly free. And so, Lord, I pray that as we come together in this room and come together around our television in various rooms, living room, kitchen, bathroom, whatever room, Father, your people are gathering, in whatever nation they are, I thank you for your presence that is in that room. And your presence is never to entertain us, but to equip us. To equip us. To equip us. That even when we didn't feel anything, we believe. We believe what we hear, what we have heard coming from the Spirit, and we receive it and know that we have now come into a moment. We have come into a timing. We have come into a season that you have purpose to be activated right now in this room, right now in somebody's room. There is a timing. There is a purpose. There is a, my God, a season that is upon you in your kitchen. There is a season that is upon you in your bedroom. There is a season that is upon you. Oh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to announce the year of the Lord. The year of the Lord. The year of the Lord. Which is born of the flesh is flesh. Your emotion is connected to the flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. And the spirit is stronger than the flesh. So walk in the spirit. Walk in the spirit. Live in the spirit. Be spirit. And worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Because the Father is seeking such to worship Him. You're not an emotional creature. You are a spirit being. You are a spirit being. You are a spirit being. And that's why the Holy Spirit comes to live in your spirit. You have spirit. He comes to live in you. So that you can experience the life of God. And show off the power of who God really is. And that when you come to him, you are free from all of these bondages. Those who walk not after the flesh, those who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For those who walk after the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But those who walk after the spirit and sow in the spirit will of the spirit reap life and peace. Father, thank you for the ministry of the word and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in this room and beyond this room. And I pray, Father, that for the many that have been coming here for years around me and months and weeks, I pray that today will be the day that they truly repent, that they truly have an encounter with you that they've never had before. When we walk out of this room and step over the threshold and step out of the room, So it will be, so it will be that we have had that experience that we have stepped out of the flesh and we have stepped into the spirit. John was in the spirit and the Lord's day and he heard a voice from heaven, come up higher, not the flesh, 
Notice he was in the spirit to hear that. And when he came, when he came up, he said immediately, 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 the spirit took his spirit. And he said, I saw a door standing in heaven open. I saw a door standing in heaven open. And I saw a throne. And one sitting on the throne to be looked upon like a jasper and sardis stone. Oh my God. The reason why many of us can't even hear the spirit. We're clothed in flesh. The flesh blinds you. The flesh deafens you. The flesh imprisons you. John was in the spirit. Come on brothers. Come on sisters. Get in the spirit. John was in the spirit. And the Lord's day. And he heard a voice from heaven. You can only hear from heaven when you're in the spirit. You can only hear from heaven when you are in the spirit. Your earring, your physical, natural ear is for you to hear things on the earth. You can't hear from heaven with your natural ears. Father, I pray that you will continue your ministry to every single one in whatever way they need that ministry. Today, you know exactly what the needs are. You know. And so, Father, thank you for your peace, your joy, your strength, your comfort. And everything else that is needed. In Christ's name I pray. And tell you thanks. Amen. 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 Seated if you can, please. I'm going to ask two persons to come. We read Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3. I want these two chapters to be read at the same time together because they are so connected. Revelation chapters 2 and 3. So those of you that are watching, please, and those of you listening, if you're able, take your Bibles, go to that book. Revelation. Revelation. Let us read it with an open mind so that the spirit of the word can be rightly seen and received. We're not going to impose ourselves on it anymore. We're going to take, we're not going to take away and we're not going to add. We're going to make sure that exactly the way that God intends for us to read it, hear it, and receive it, it is so. Go ahead, my brother, turn it on. Revelation chapter 2. To the church, to the angels of the church of Ephesus, write these things, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, hmm. who walk in the midst of the seven golden lampstand. I know your works. Yeah. Your labor, mm -hmm. your patience, mm -hmm. and that you are, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. Hmm. Wow. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. And have found them liars. Hmm. And you have persevered and have patient and of labor for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Wow. Nevertheless, mm. I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, 
and do not and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly, quickly. and remove your lampstand from its place wow. unless you repent. Wow. But this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Hmm. He who has an ear, let him hear That's what it. the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcome, I will give to eat wow. from the tree of life, <laughs> which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Wow. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write these things, says the first and the last, who was dead was and dead. come to life. Wow. I know your works, mm -hmm. tribulation, yeah. poverty, and poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Wow. But do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you mm. into prison. Mm -hmm. That you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Ten days. Be faithful hmm. until death. And I will give you the crown of, life. of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcome shall not be hurt by the second death. Wow. And to the angels of the church in Pergamos, write these things, said he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works mm -hmm. and where you dwell, where Satan throne is. is. Wow. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith. Even in the day in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Wow. But I have a few things against you, because you have, you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, hmm. who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to, to eat things sacrificed to idol to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Hmm. Thus you also are those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Repent. Repent. Or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them wow. with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcome, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. Wow. Hidden. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no, no one, one knows wow. except him who receive it. Whew. And to the angels, and to the angel of the church in Tyatara, write these things, say the Son of God, yes. who has eyes. Like, like a flame like, of fire, wow. and his feet like fine brass, 
I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for you, and as for your work, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, mm -hmm. I have few things against you because you allow that woman, mm -hmm. Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, mm. prophetess. <laughs> yeah. to teach, yeah. to teach and seduce my servant to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she, she did, not. did not repent. Indeed, wow. I will cast her into a sickbed, hmm. and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless, unless. they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children hmm. with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he yes. who searches the mind and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you, I say, and to the rest in Tyatara, as many as do not of this doctrine, who have not known the depth of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcome yes. and keep my words yes. until the end, to him I will give power over the nation. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel, as I also have received, received from my, my father. father. Wow. And I will give him the, the morning, morning star, star, he who has an yeah. ear, let him hear what the, what the Spirit. Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Is that going to work? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect <laughs> before God. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments and shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Wow. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the angel in Philadelphia write, These things, he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens mm -hmm. and no one shuts, 
and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have little strength, have kept my word and have not denied my name. Oh, Indeed, Father. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Wow. Mm. It's God who does the work. Yes. Because you have kept my command to preserve, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Hmm. Because you have kept my command and yes. preserved, these things will happen. I will also keep you from the hour of trial that yes. shall come upon the whole world earth yes to test those who dwell on the earth behold i'm coming quickly hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown he who overcomes i will make him a pillar in the temple of my god mm. and he shall go out no more wow i write on him the name of my, my god, god. And the name of the city of my God, Ooh. the Jerusalem, which comes down <laughs> out of heaven from my, my God. God. And I will write on him my new, new name. name. <laughs> he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the angel of the church of, La of La Laodiceans, write, these things, the amen, the faithful, and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. <laughs> I know your works, wow. that you are neither cold nor hot. Hmm. I could wish you were cold or hot. Wow. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. <laughs> Because you say, I am rich, mm. I have become wealthy, I have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, that you're miserable, you're poor, and you're blind and naked. naked. <laughs> I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye slav, mm. that you may see as many as I love, I, I rebuke, rebuke and chasten. chasten. <laughs> Therefore, be zealous and repent. Yes. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen, amen, amen. Wow, thank you. Thank you. In verse 19 of chapter 3, it says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And many times when the Spirit speaks through me, He's chastening and He's rebuking. And you know what some of us do? We take offense and we pull back. And some people even leave. But notice what he says. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. 
Be quick to receive it and repent. No pull back, no get offended. I say, oh, every time you come about this, that, that. Be zealous and repent. If God, listen to me, if God doesn't love you, he will never talk to you, much less to correct you when you're doing something wrong. Many of us, when we're growing up with our parents, and I'm not saying that they were proper parents, because a lot of them weren't. But when they chastise us, and some of us, the chastisement was, was very harsh. In today's world, it would be considered child abuse. And a lot of them would have gone to prison and still they're prison right now. <laughs> but in the moment, we thought that they hated us. But they were doing the best that they knew. If you don't love someone, you will never correct them. You will never want anything that is good for them. I am not your enemy. And I hope you're listening to me. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. So when the rebuke come, you don't take offense. You be zealous and receive it. Repent. Because it's for your good. It's for your good. We, 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 our manliness need to spark at the door when you come inside here. I'm a man. I'm a man. No man when you come to God. <laughs> You're a man too <laughs> when you come to God. <laughs> And you don't want Jesus to come and fight against you. Because I promise you, it's a fight that you cannot, you won't win. So be zealous and repent. Um, let me share a few things here. One. I believe some of you have heard already. Brother Luke, sister passed, I think maybe about two, three weeks or so. The funeral is coming up um, sometime here, maybe this week or so. Is it this week, sir? It, no, it, next week if it's Sunday, but it's close. <laughs> So keep him in prayer as he goes down for the funeral and so forth. And um, I was thinking it was a, a few months ago, a couple of months ago, his wife, father passed, now his sister passed. And so they're mourning again. So keep them in prayer. And then some of you would have also heard about that sister, Ivan Ellis, her mom, she went down to see her mom and the, before she got to where she was, she passed. While she's in the island, her mom passed. So she didn't get to have a final word with her. But again, you know, that is all for this side of life. Aren't you glad over there no death and no funeral and no... Parting and nobody now will say goodbye. We're, we're going to be together forever. You will not feel, you will not sense any abandonment or any body leaving. You won't feel that again. Because even right now, even when we come together in this room, for some of us, it, 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 the, the, the experience we have in the spirit, it, it's like we could all just stay. Let's stay together forever. But now, it's not possible. We have to poo, 
over there, no pooing. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> no peeing. Wow. Can you imagine? You can't imagine it because <laughs> no baby diaper, no adult, a di no male wearing no diaper. There will be no porta potty. Even when you eat from the tree of life, you notice in one of, the, one of the church, he made a promise to them that he will give them to eat from the tree of life in the paradise of my God. Even when you eat from that, you will not poo. You will not poo. Angels doesn't poo. God doesn't allow pooing in heaven. <laughs> it sounds funny, but it's true. It's true. It's true. So I don't know if anybody else, so those are the two persons that I know of at the moment that is, you know, mourning in this time. And um, I think for Sister Ellis, um, Sister Evan, I don't know if she's here today because of work. Oh, right there. <laughs> um, you, the, if the funeral is in May, Mo May 4th. You know, that's our son's birthday. Yeah, wow. Celebrating one life and celebrating the life of another because even when you go to the funeral, you're actually celebrating the life of that person. Hopefully that they really lived a good life because you imagine you go to a gunman, a murder, a funeral. What are you celebrating? At that funeral, the only song they sing, murderer! <laughs> <laughs> you can't sing, there were 90 and 9 that were safely laid. You can't sing Amazing Grace at that funeral. Murderer. <laughs> But well, you celebrate the life of the person. So in, in both ways, you're celebrating the life of one, moving on, celebrating the life of one who has run their race and have come to the end of their journey. So keep them in prayer, as I said. Um, some time ago, Sister Joan from Trinidad sent a prayer request for a friend, a sister friend of hers by the name of Gloria and request that we prayed for Gloria. Anybody remember? And so she sent me this message on Thursday. The pastor, good morning. After many diagnoses and many bad tablets, my sister Gloria, doctor, looking to give her some kind of sickness, but she continued to believe God and said the opposite to what they, the doctor, said. And I encourage and stand in agreement with her. They gave her all kinds of sickness and all kinds of stuff that was happening in her body. And you know when you have children, they want you to take and to do everything. The doctor says, but God. The doctor says all of those things, but God. The doctor finally gave up and asked that what she is doing, and asked what she is doing. She said, priors. Priors. Mm-hmm. They encourage her to keep on praying because they are seeing nothing at all. No cancer, no vertigo, nothing at all. They nearly killed the woman. <laughs> Uh, that's what she said. They nearly killed a woman <laughs> with all these rubbish. Thanks God, thanks be to God who has proven himself in her life once again. 
And thanks to you, Pastor, and the Kalen family for praying and believing God with us. No more cancer. No more vertigo. To God be the glory. Those of you that are in this room, that God is in this room. He's still a healer. He will never stop healing. And those of you that are watching, I don't care what the sickness are, is, and I don't care what doctor says, because doctors are speaking from head knowledge. They don't know much. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. They don't know much. Whatever they know is what they study, and their study is still limited. And if you notice, after they study for how many years at medis the, the College of Medicine, how many years did you study for, for to be a doctor? You didn't try it? <laughs> Eight? Seven? Wow, that's a lot of years. And even after they spend all that years, come, then come out and they're still practicing. And you are the guinea pig. They stab you, then pork you, then cut you. They say, oh, you feel anything? <laughs> tell, me, tell me what you feel. And then based on what you tell them, they say, I'm going to prescribe this for two weeks. They're not sure. They, they study for so long and they still don't know about God. God not study. And God is not a practitioner. God is the creator. And God is the healer. When he heals, no side effect. They even operate on you and shut you up with scissors inside of you and clippers and wire and sp sponges and stuff in you. <laughs> God doesn't make those blunders. So to God be the glory. They are seeing, I need to read that again, they are seeing nothing. At all, no cancer, no vertigo, nothing at all. <laughs> and, and then she said, and, and I'm hearing her Trini accent, they nearly killed the woman. <laughs> <laughs> but God, hallelujah, only God. And Father, thank you for who you are. And I, we give you all the glory. We give you all the glory. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. Father, thank you for all these persons that you have healed. I thank you for those that will be healed today. And I thank you, Lord, for the healing that will take place tomorrow and throughout the week. You, you are a healing God. Father, somebody will come on and watch this, and they will experience healing on Wednesday. They will experience healing next week, next month. Father, you are a healing God. Thank you for healing people of vertigo. Thank you for healing people of cancer, diabetes, arthritis, liver, whatever, whatever the condition, heart condition, name it, Father. Skeletal structure that are deformed and all different types of things happening in the body. I thank you that you are God, the creator, and you who create the body. You don't have to study the body to know what needs to be done. You are the God who created it, and you are the God who has the power to heal it without a cut. You have the power to heal it without a cut. You have the power to heal without a cut. And so, Father, we give you praise and glory for somebody that is receiving their healing right now in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Um, we have our... The Montreal trip, when we talk about it, it seems so far. But then it's getting closer. It's what, week after next? Wow. Have you been praying about it? Praying for what the Lord will do? And for those of you that will be there, you're going to be in the immediate moment of what he's doing. 
and those that are watching, you will experience the same thing if you're open to receive it. I think they, 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 if they haven't done it already, they will do it. But the, the, the streaming on that Sunday will start later because their meeting time, because they, they're renting somewhere, so the starting time is 1.30. 1.30. And um, Quebec and here is the same time zone, right? So it's 1.30. So do not go there for 11. You will sit there. And they're not going to put a counter for f three hours or <laughs> something and have a nice music and, you know, so it's 1.30. I think it's 1.30 we would start, right? 1.30, yeah. So I'm looking forward to what God has already released. And we're going to be the conduit for it to touch hurt. It's already released in the spirit, but it needs to take on flesh. Then on the heel of that event... Not too long after, on the 18th of May, which will be about two weeks plus, two weeks and a half, our next baptism. I'm looking forward to it. And not on the heel, but coming around the corner. It's our royal gathering. The gathering of the sons, the royal sons. And we're going to have royal burger. We're going to have royal hot dog. <laughs> we're going to have royal steam fish. We're going to have royal jerk chicken. We're going to have royal jerk Pork is royal. <laughs> well, I, if, <laughs> well, if royalty is dealing with it, then it's royal. It's royal. Royal jerk pork. Royal bacon. <laughs> oh. Looking forward to it, to spend some time outside of this setting with you where we, we, would I say a little more real? Because, you know, we're going to see some people showing off their legs. <laughs> <laughs> Sister P, <laughs> we're going to see them in a way that you would never see them in this room, you know, real. And uh, I think of Jesus that, you know, you see many times teaching, preaching, whether he's in the wilderness, he's in the temple, he's somewhere, you know, doing ministry. But there are those moments where he would go even like when the scripture said Lazarus and Mary and Martha was his friends. So this is the place where he would go and stop and, you know, take off his sandals and relax and have a meal. That's different. It's, it's uh, because when you're eating meal, and especially in the minds of the Jewish people, when you have a meal with someone, it is considered you sharing your salt with them. And when you, whoever you share your salt with, they are your friends. You don't share salt with your enemy. You don't share salt with your enemy. So salt speaks of a covenant of friendship. And it's a, listen to me, it's an everlasting friendship. It lasts as long as the person lives. When you make a salt covenant, it cannot be broken. You are the salt of the earth. 
the way how we live with each other, it's supposed to make the world be afraid. We are the salt of the earth. That when you say yes, your yes is yes. After the royal hamburger, what, what follows? The rest of the year, I don't know. Hmm? <laughs> um, we'll see. But that is what we have in the pipeline. And we're looking forward to it. Amen? Amen? As we get closer, you know, certain things that need to be done, we need manual, physical help with stuff, so all of that will be put together as we did last year. So you will tick off where you will help and make the day even more beautiful than it was last year. If you go on the YouTube, not YouTube, the Facebook page, you see some of the videos from last year there? Even the video that she did <laughs> for Jamaica? Yeah. Very funny. Very funny. Especially the part when Tori and run in. <laughs> <She put it. laughs> so we're going to have fun with each other again. Nice, clean, beautiful fun. Because we love each other. And when you love somebody, you don't do them any harm. Amen? I don't know if we have anyone visiting with us for the first time today. If you're here, I'm going to ask you just to stand wherever you are for a second or so. If you're visiting with us for the first time. Your first name, please. Chanel. Oh, Chanel number five. <laughs> Your first name? Avon. G Avon J. Avon Jilly. Ah. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, behind the camera. Hi, your first name? Elaine. Elaine. Thank you. That's it. I'm going to ask someone. Um, Elaine, who invited you? Your daughter. Ah, how are you? Good. Um, Chanel? Who invited you? Your neighbor. Uh, are you sisters? Oh, you're kidding me. Look at her. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you could pass for sisters. So I don't want the person who invited you to do this. I want somebody else, three, five, six, or nine, or 69 of them, to give you a welcome hug. Put your hands together for them and welcome them. I've been saying this, and I hope that you are doing it. Because if you don't, you are setting up people for one or two things. They're either going to come and leave knowing that they have been in a room where the voice of God was released. And they're either going to receive it or reject it. 
I am not here. I will never, I don't care if, 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 I, if I remain alone, I will not be a part of the circus of church. And many people, when they hear the word church, there are various types of ideas and images and whatever is coming to their mind. And so when they're coming even here, they're coming expecting church as usual. And if you did not prepare them, they might be disappointed. Anybody remember? So we're at this junction. This is the most important part of the meeting. This is the reason why we're in the room. Anybody remember when the war between Israel and um, Hamas started? On the 7th of October, 2023. Is it over? No. How many months is that now? Six months, going seven months? I want you to listen to me very carefully. I hope you will. Anybody remember the same week that it started? I think we had a fasting meeting here. Anybody remember what I said about it? And I said it's going to be, this is the reason why we as the church need to pay attention. Because for the world, it's not the first that Israel and Hamas has been at war. But it's always short. Lasts for a few days, a few weeks. Never go into months as it is right now and if you pay attention to what is going on because i told you that the present war going on right now with israel it is going to spread even further it's a part of the signs of the time listen to me i'm not trying to make up scare tactics or whatever you need to know what is going on what Time it is in God's timing. And do not get careless and miss what you're supposed to be paying attention to. It was last week or either the week before Israel killed an Iranian whatever person in Syria or somewhere there. As a result of that, the Ayatollah, which is the supreme leader of Iran, made a promise to the people of Iran that it will not go lightly. There will be a retaliation. I am saying to you people that if Iran get involved with what's going on with Israel. And let me tell you something, Israel, they, not, they do not back down. If you notice what's going on, the international courts, the courts in South Africa, the, the courts in, 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 in Sweden, name it, everywhere they're saying that Israel need, Israel this. And all they're talking, Israel said, this is the moment where we're going to wipe out Hamas. So even what they are saying and doing, Israel is not stopping and Israel has a right to defend them, their self, themselves. But this one, this particular war, there was the Six-Day War in 1960-something. In and there is the Yom Kippur War. And, and there's a lot of wars that you go back and look at history with the middle, in the Middle East with Israel and these neighboring countries. And every single one of them that is around Israel, their intent is to wipe Israel off the map. They have tried for years and they're still going to try to the very end. But it's something that is impossible. Even if Israel is in the wrong, they cannot do it. You know why? 
Because God's word, God's word is backing that land. And if we are of God, we must believe these things. We must believe these things. But I want to bring it to your attention, to pay attention. I want to bring it to your attention, to pay attention to what's going on there. I'm paying attention more, even more carefully now to things around me than I did a year before or a month ago or a week ago. Did you notice last week, Monday, when all this hype and this craze and this thing people pay one night in, in Niagara Falls, hotels, hotel room rate went up to hundreds, even into the thousands. And people paid it because they said, according to the projection, right in that Niagara region, you're going to see the full total eclipse. Monday, not a lot of people around saw anything. It was a cloudy day. My son said, Daddy, can you get some eclipse glasses for me? I did. <laughs> then after I said, Daddy, it was a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> and a waste of money. Because during the time, it, it got a little bit dark in, in our area, in Alice, and like it overcast. And I went out with him and I looked. I said, Emmanuel, you just have to imagine i can only imagine <laughs> but there were places where they saw it there were places in the states and so on that they saw because even in niagara they didn't really see it that much because the cloud was there but it got dark darker than it did in our area and what I, why I brought it up, don't you notice everybody talking about the scientists, the, the CNN people, this BBC, the NBC, the, the, the name it, everybody. And nobody give God. Nobody. Everybody. People all propose. People got married. People bought cats. People bought dogs because, you know, later on, this dog is, you, you know what his name is? Eclipse. Why did you, why, why is his name? Eclipse? Oh, I bought him on the eclipse. <laughs> or they're going to name some people name, you know, their children Solar. <laughs> or whatever the case may be. It's a crazy world out there. And I listen and I listen and I listen. And nobody gave God the glory. And in the moment of everything happening, I remember Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows off his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech. Night unto night shows off the knowledge of our God. Because that event, that's God. That's God. That's not man. Man can study it. But the workings of it are God. So you and I need to come on the side of God and give God the glory. Because you know, the sun is many times over larger than the moon. But in that moment, because of how it is positioned, it's as if the moon covers the sun. And that is known as a solaric because it's the moon covering the sun. You have lunar eclipse where the sun covers the moon. Because lunar, moon. <laughs> and what happens, it's not the sun actually going in front of the moon. It's the earth going between the sun and the moon. And that's all God. God just create everything and put it out there in his work, and it just, it, it's just processing itself. And notice, it doesn't happen every other week. It, it, it's, it's what, 70 odd years ago they said we had a, a total eclipse? And then the next one, and it, it, I don't think it's going to be a total eclipse. It's it, 20, 40, 40, 44? 20, 44. 
they said the next total, total eclipse is the next 120 years. So when any man will out there and say, man, well, well, the next 120 years, he said, and his, and his mother said, you, 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 you may be alive. <laughs> because now he's what, nine? 120. So he would have been, if he lived to see it, 129. It's possible. So I said, son, I wish you well. <laughs> you know, to see. <laughs> To see that then. If, and, and then my wife also said, if the Lord tarries, when I see that, I wonder how many of us as even believers in Christ glorify God. Glorify God. So, I want to continue teaching the word of God. I want to continue to equip the people of God for effective kingdom living. When? Now. And one of the things that is vitally important is faith. Look, look, look at this. Look at this desk. What is going on here? It's not stable. And you know why it's not? It's not the wheels. It's not balance. Right here is lower, so it's, it's rocking. So for me to balance it, get something to put on the here to, as they say, catch it. <laughs> and it would stay level. I'm using that to say this, not a lot of people that are around church are in church, even in the pulpit, even the pastors, where their faith is concerned, they are not stable. And that's what happened. When things are not stable, you don't have any guarantee that things are going to stay in place. As soon as you pass and bounce against it, things, you're grabbing have you ever gone in a restaurant and you sit around a table that is not? And many people take it very lightly. And even this teaching that I'm doing, many of you come in here and you come in here for entertainment. You come in here, you're on your phone, you're doing stuff, and you're not paying attention to what I'm teaching. God Almighty help you! Because what the enemy is after is your, is your faith in God. Even the scriptures that were read. Notice when Jesus says, I know your works. I've seen your patience and how you have kept your faith intact. Because if Satan knows that if he can get you, your faith to be contaminated, you are dead. While you live. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. Romans chapter 1 verse 17. Galatians chapter 3 verse 11. Hebrews chapters 10 verse 38. Remember what it says? You remember what it says people? Those that have been in the class for the past weeks, you remember what it says? What those four chapters have in common with those four verses, the just shall, it's not a joke. You need to understand how important faith is to your walk with God. And what Satan is fighting is not money. It's not the money. He will use the money to rob you of your faith in God. But it's not the money that he is concerned. Satan doesn't want your money. He wants your faith. Satan doesn't want your house. He wants your faith. So he will use your house. Do you, do you think that Satan needed Job how many thousands of animals and hundreds of animals that he had? The 500 this and the 300 this because God doubled it at the end when Job persevered. 
Did you think that Job, that Satan wanted Job camels? Was it his sheep that he needed? Was it even the children, these 10 children? It, was it the children that Satan wanted? Remember what Satan said to God? Remove the edge. Because we know from the scriptures that Satan was checking out Job before. But when he checked out Job and got close to him, he realized that he could not touch him. You remember reading the scripture? When the sons of God, the sons of God by creation, speaking of the angels, the Bible said they appeared before God. So what that meant is that angels, when they are sent out by God an assignment, and their assignment is completed, they have to come back and report to God. <laughs> So when they're sent to do something where you're concerned, they have to go back and report to God, even though God knows that's the order. So the Bible said there was a day when the sons of God, the angels appear before God, and Satan, the Bible said, also showed up. And God, as if he doesn't know, because God wants to expose him so that you and I would know something. The question God asks him is not for God to get information. It's for you and I to get knowledge about Satan. God said, where are you coming from? He said, oh, come on, don't you know? I am coming. I go up and down, to and fro throughout all the earth. So we know. And he doesn't do it in person. Because if Satan is in this room right now, purely Satan in this room right now, he cannot be in Jamaica. So he has, he has, he has, a, he has a network of demonic spirit that is representing him in another country while he's in this room. Ask him. Mr. Ask him. Some of you have an email and you have a Twitter feed. Ask him if I know that, if I know so you go. He has a network because Satan doesn't have the ability to be omnipresent, only God. He said, I am up and down. So, 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 so he must work hard, up and down, up and up and down, to and fro throughout all the earth. I go and give him work for do until Jesus come and finally destroy him. Walk him. Every time he come, you rebuke him, bossing head, hurt up a wound where Jesus booze him and bossing head already, stepping out again and stop behave like a baby. Pastor. <laughs> the, the, the devil, the devil. Never let the devil see you crying because of something that he did against you. You can cry. There are tears of that's the only one you're supposed to cry. A ball because Satan, <laughs> the devil, the devil. No, he doesn't deserve that because God is too big for you to cry if Satan come against you. So God asked him that question, as I said, to expose him to you and I. I was saying to somebody yesterday, I said, everything that we need to know about the devil, the scripture reveals it. And it's only those of us who wants to be ignorant will remain ignorant. The things that Jesus says about Satan is to give you and I information so that we can know how he works. Because guess what? His method of doing things does not change. He only knows to steal, kill, and destroy. He will dress it up differently. But it's the same devil with the same motive of operation. Modus operando. That's the Latin, right? So when Jesus says certain things, pay attention to it. When Jesus says that I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions, what is he revealing about demons? They have the ability to harm you. When you think of a scorpion, what, what, what is the thing that comes to your mind? A beautiful domestic household pet that I'm going to sleep with in my bed and I'm going to have him in my bed and I'm going to say, Scarpy, oh, I love you, Scarpy. And you go to sleep with Scarpy in the bed? 
the only thing Scarpy knows to do. And it doesn't matter how you pet Scarpy. When you turn on your back and open your mouth and start snoring, Scarpy come up. And Scarpy look down in your mouth and Scarpy touch your tongue. Demons are not something to play with. And Jesus gives you authority to cast them out. You do not argue with them. I will never give them the time of day to have a conversation. I want them to know how much I hate them. Don't have any conversation with them. Cast them out. You don't... Why under God heaven? You have gone to meeting and you say, pastors, did they tend to spend 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes to ask the demon where they come from? You're not supposed to ask the demon where you come from. You must know where they come from. Jesus tells us where they come from. Who, hear this. Who send you? <laughs> if, you're, if you say that you're in God and asking a demon who send you, you need a slap. The, no, if the demon slap you, I laugh. Because you know what? You know why many people do that? We want to show off our self. If you notice, Jesus do not. Jesus did not. Jesus never hold a conversation with a duppy. He cast the duppy out. The duppy trying to keep a conversation going on Jesus. Notice he said, hold your peace and come out. You remember why the world end up in the state that it end up in where sin is concerned? Somebody had a conversation brother Jackson somebody invited Satan for coffee and had coffee and donut with him he showed up he even knew because even the very body that he took on and start oh oh all of a sudden, Heavy got all excited. Oh, do you want me to give you a tour around the garden? Oh, yes, all the trees. God said that we're supposed to eat. Women, watch yourself. And you notice today, women that are not submitted to the Spirit of Christ, we chat a lot. Notice even when the Bible talks about gossip, it's a female that is connected with it. You have, you have men who are sissies. Who will gossip, but it's not the norm for a male. And much less when you are in Christ. You're not supposed to love chatty chatty. He who keeps his mouth keeps his life. And the Bible says where the, where the multitude of words is, sin always present. Because if you're chatty chatty, you go and chat yourself into sin. Enemy is always picking conversations. Like now I understand in Canada, one of the conversation warm-up starter, you would say, for conversations in Canada, the weather. The weather. Doesn't matter how you see a grumpy looking person and say, lovely day. Oh, <laughs> yes, lovely day. <laughs> And they move on. <laughs> but you need to understand this. That it's not every conversation is for you as a son of God. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel, the conversation of the ungodly. Let people say what they want to say. Learn. Begin to discipline yourself. To be in a place for a hour, two hour, three hour. And do not say a word. Some of you is like somebody on drugs. And they decide to. What the term? What do you use it? Then go cold turkey? Why not the turkey? Why not hot turkey? 
But anyway, they decide to go cold turkey. Then start shake. Some of you, if, if you don't get to talk, you, 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 you feel uncomfortable. Sit down in a place for two hours. Sit among people around you. Because the conversation that they're in, you can't touch it. If you touch it when you leave, you have to repent. Or while you're dead, you have to repent in your heart. You can't be a part of it. Learn to be somewhere. Learn from Jesus. That all, watch it, whole night, they had him in front of the high priest. Bring him to four Pilate the following day. And the whole day, and Jesus was dumb. Till Pilate got upset. Don't you hear me talking to you? Who do you think I am? Don't you know that I have power to crucify you and power to let you go? And Jesus, for one second, <laughs> you could have no power over me unless it was given to you of my father from above. Bam. As they say in Jamaica, Jamaican Proverbs, Kananapo. I don't know if Google know it. But ask Google what Kananapo, <laughs> what it means. It means to shut your mouth. In Canada, you say, zip it. Hush. It really, I'm telling you, it kept me from a lot of, a lot of, it kept me from being engaged in sin. And God has helped me. God has allowed that, that character to develop in me. I can be in a place for hours and you don't hear salam <laughs> from me. And when you don't talk, people get nervous. The Bible says, even a fool, when he keeps his mouth shut, people will consider that he is wise. Let me say it again. It's in Proverbs. Even a fool, when he keeps his mouth shut. Because you notice, your mouth puts you in a lot of trouble. The Bible says in James that the tongue, every kind of animal that exists, is a man can tame it. Man controlled a huge ship with just a small rudder. He said, but the tongue, the Bible says, the tongue, no man, it did not say God cannot. It says no man can tame. You need to give God your tongue. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't care if you care or not. I am here to tell you today, give God your tongue. The Bible said the tongue is a poison and it sets on fire the course of nature. The tongue destroys more lives than the gun does. Even in this room, certain offense that have been running now for many seasons, it's because of the tongue. Boy, if I can get you to learn that. Watch your mouth. And I'm not going to apologize if the Holy Spirit wants me to linger a little on it. Because some tongue too loose. It needs to tighten up. As a matter of fact, it needs to tie. <laughs> Even where faith is concerned. You have got to watch what you are saying if you're living by faith. Because what you say, you shall have. I didn't say that. That's one of the principles of faith. Faith requires that you speak. So you hear, you receive the instructions from God. And because you believe it, you also say it. 2 Corinthians Chapter 4, verse 13 says, As it is written, I believe and therefore I speak. Notice, I believe and therefore I speak. But speak what? Speak what you believe from God. 
It says, therefore, we also, having the same spirit of faith, we also speak. I am not just going to quote it and leave it. As I go down the road with this teaching, I'm going to go to the scripture and show you. As it is written, as it is written, I believe and therefore I speak. Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High God. What is the secret place? What does it look like? Right? Shall abide... Under the shadow of the Almighty. Wow. Shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Notice, I will say of the Lord. What are you going to say? I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. My God in Him will I trust. And you continue to say, surely he shall deliver me from the snare, the trap of the hunter. Fowler means hunter. Snare means trap. Hallelujah. You know who is the hunter? Who is hunting you? Who is after your faith? It's surely he shall deliver me from the snare, from the trap of the hunter. The sun shall not smite me by day. It's not talking about the natural sun. Of course, God can preserve from that. But it's not talking. It's talking about the things that the enemy will do against you in the daytime. Because notice it says, nor the moon by night. A thousand, watch this, you continue to say what God says. A thousand shall fall at my side. A thousand shall fall at my side. So the thousand falling at my side, which means they're on the left side because it's and 10,000 at my right hand. So the other thousand is on the left side. But watch this. While all kinds of things going around you, left and right, it shall not. It shall not. Why? Because I am dwelling in the secret place. I said, touch somebody again and tell them, watch what you are saying. It's not a joke, it's a principle. It's a principle of faith. David in Psalm 118. David had a lot of persons turn against him and became his enemy. Some of them for nothing. That if you sit down and ask them, why do you hate David? I don't know. I just hate him. Remember? The scripture said, they hate me without a cause. Even Jesus, loving, kind, compassionate, merciful Jesus, they hated him without a cause. Pilate said, but what have he done? He said, I have examined him and I find no fault of death in him. Do you want me to release him? No! He said, but according to the custom, you, you require that I release a prisoner doing Passover to you. Do you want me to release the man, this man, the man you call Christ? They said, no. You remember what their request was? We want Barabbas. Barabbas was a notorious murderer. 
and they denied the Prince of Peace. So listen to me. You and I need to wake up and face reality. That if you're following Christ, and Christ was the green tree, and he said, if they do this to the green tree, what are they going to do to the dry tree? Don't be shocked. Don't be surprised. Don't go to bed and lose sleep over it. If somebody hates you and you can't find no cause why they would. That co-worker? That co-worker? Stop worrying yourself and afraid. Don't even pray about it. Just keep a smile on your face and go and do what you have to do. Because you don't have no control over the will of a person. And if they decide to turn themselves over to evil, darkness, Satan, there is nothing that you can do about it. All you got to do is to keep on standing. Having done all to stand, you keep on standing. Stand in faith. Keep the shield of faith up. People will hate you and cannot give an explanation of why they hate you. Judy, even if they could have said, it's our eyes. <laughs> our eyes just... <laughs> but they can't. It, 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 it really hit me at first when I just started to walk with God. When these things happen. And boy... I am doing everything because, you know, I want everybody to like me. So I'm investigating and I'm saying, but I didn't do anything. And, and, and you know, you want to go and have conversation with them and say, why you hate me? Come on, you need to tell me. What did I do to you? It's a waste of time. Learn what the scripture says. They hated me without a cause. Even some of you in this room were not like me. You come in here on a skinny teeth, but you really don't like me. You can't even tell why you don't like me. It's just that the devil in you don't like the God in me. And the God in me don't like the devil in you. And that's going to be the reality when you walk in with Christ. As many who desire to live godly, they will have wonderful glorious journey of peace and everybody loving them everybody loving and kind and patting them on the back and say well done you're such a wonderful oh for she's a jolly good whatever <laughs> which nobody can deny Heep, poop, poop, heep, poop, heep, heep, heep. hooray you're not going to get that from everybody even your own family, they hate you and can't tell why they hate you. Some people just envy you and you never have nothing. Not even a gold teeth. You envy the person for a car that they have on loan or leased is not even for them. What a foolishness. What, what foolishness. You envy a person for a house that is not theirs. On paper, then tell you, say, I feel you, but I don't feel you. Because if you're paying mortgage, which part are it for you? Not even one of the shingle, a shingle you call it, the, the thing that is on the roof. It's not even yours because miss a couple, miss a couple payments, ladies and gentlemen. And see if CIBC no see you. Um, <laughs> and all of a sudden, you start get calls. And some of us, we avoid answering it, but they keep on calling. And they keep on calling. And they're making note of it. That every time they're calling, you didn't answer. They're making note of it. And it's going on your file. And then watch this. If you don't answer that phone. And you don't go in and have a talk with them. And you keep on avoiding them. And running away from them. They stay right in their office. And lean your house. That when you go in there, you wonder, oh, you walk so sideways. And, 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 and this, this morning, when you leave, the house did straight. Then leave your house. <laughs> when I ever 
heard the concept the first time when I came in. And he said, oh, they will put a lien. I said, put a lien on my house? Well, I mean, I mean they're really strong. What are they going to do to lien the house? And when they put the lien on the house, it becomes, watch this, impossible for you to sell it. Because when you are now put, when you put that house on the, on the market, they're, 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 as a matter of fact, if you decide to sell it, all of those information, something, it have to come up. It, and if you didn't tell it, it's going to come up. And nobody wants to buy a lean house. <laughs> the bank knows exactly what to do to get it. So at the end of the day, when we're envying people, you have got to ask yourself the question, what I'm envying the person about, is it really theirs? Even when you envy the sister for her hair. <laughs> I mean, she said, oh, I bought it, but is it really hers? Because if the spirit move upon her. <laughs> oh, Lord, to the ear. <laughs> and, 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 and shake her two times. I've seen it happen in meetings. The Holy Spirit moving and brother, sister fall out and then you look, you see the hair walking away. <laughs> what, what do we really hone? What do we really hone? Because anything that you're going to envy me for in this life, it is something that is here today. And tomorrow, it's gone. And Jesus in, in, in Luke chapter 12, I'm still talking about faith. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus was teaching. The crowd was there. Certain things happened. And then Jesus draw the attention of the disciples to it. In the moment of Jesus teaching, this man came up and he said, Lord, I need you to do something for me. Jesus said, what? He said, I want you to arbitrate between me and my brother that he give me a part of the inheritance and Jesus said man who made me a divider between you and your brother where your inheritance is concerned and when he walked away the Bible said Jesus looked at the disciple and he says take heed and be careful of covetous. Say the rest. Covetousness. Things that people covet another person for. And end up being bitter. You hear me say, hear, hear. Do you understand? Hear. We fall out. Would you covet Trisha for her eyelashes? <laughs> brother, 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 brother Patrick, brother Patrick, it is well, right? You, you, ever, you ever wake up sometime and you see some little here in the bed? You, you know where they come from, right? <laughs> Looks beautiful. You know, even when my wife does it and she just finished doing it and come home and it just, her, height, her eyes get brighter, it just pop. <laughs> uh, hey. But then she lay down in the bed. <laughs> in the morning, most time I'm the one that spread the bed. And when I'm spreading up, I say, <laughs> <laughs> And I, I sometimes say, hon. <laughs> it's a wicked spirit. And when you walk and live in covetousness and envy and all of those things, it's not destroying the one that you are coveting. It's destroying you. Jesus says... Beware of covetousness. You hear what he says? 
And we all, as God's people, need to pay attention to it. And we need to let it become flesh. He says, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. And we are tricked. The devil lied to us to let us believe that is what you have make you somebody. And so we will do anything to get the thing. If you want to be with me. Nothing for nothing. You've got to have something if you want to be with me. What have you done for me lately? And men, some of us as men, you remember, you remember when we never know God? All some of you right now say you know God and you still do it. And you, you're under pressure to get this woman. And you see her, and, and they use the term high maintenance. Because when you look at the nails, the eyelashes, the eyebrow, because sometimes, again, when you all are envy and are covet somebody for them eyebrow, and of them. Because they shave off theirs and they bought a pencil for $129.59 and draw an eyebrow. Where you are, where you are envy the person for something where they draw. <laughs> and some people, they want to keep it permanently so they use a permanent marker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't have to spend no more money. And if you don't want to draw it, you go and get somebody to do it and pay a dollar or what? How many? Come on, people. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. I said a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. Jesus Christ said that in teaching the kingdom. Because in that same chapter, he goes down and he said to the disciple, Therefore, because of that, do not worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. He says, seek the kingdom of God first. He said, it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom of God. So what is Jesus saying? That everything that makes your life of any worth or value to God, it's in the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is what? The kingdom of God. What I just said a while ago, many of you in the room looking at me, many of you watching online, your life is tied up in the things you possess. And that's why you, Satan, can kill you quickly tomorrow. Because guess what? If Satan like what God allowed him to do with Job, come and take away everything that you have right now, you literally drop down and dead. Drop down. Let, let me use it. What is the term now? You would literally faint and die. Job knew that even though God had blessed him with all the things that he had, because the Bible said he was the richest man in the East. And in one day, Satan took everything. And not just the things. You imagine his ten children in a house with one of their bigger brother. And they all died immediately in that house. Everything that he had, including his very children, was taken in one day. And the Bible said, Job worshipped. He did what? He worshipped. You remember what was his, what was his, how he viewed it? He said, the Lord gave it to me. And if the Lord chose to take it, blessed be his name. Would you, you, you wear poor and I come, and I come in at the building every Sunday and I claim, say, you know, God, if you lose everything, if right now, God forbid, but if, come on, and there are times where you have to deal with these things. Because I, I, every day I look at certain things and I let the devil know that, guess what, Satan, if you even take away everything that I have right now, I will never let go of my faith in God. Because before my wife knew me, it was God. 
She would not have the husband that she have today without God in the husband. Do not let the devil think that he can use anything that is in your possession to trap you. Don't give him that idea. Not your son, not your daughter. Children are inherited. Some of us literally worship, idolize our children. I don't care if it's one you have. The one that God allow you to have is for you to be an example and train them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. It's not for you to idolize them. That if the devil should, if God should allow something to happen, you would literally drop down and dead. Emmanuel, Sister Trisha, you remember when we went to St. Jacob's? When Emmanuel was much smaller, he was about maybe three or so. And we are outside of the and Emmanuel running the crowd. And St. Jacob, St. Jacob Market, especially in a weekend, it's busy. And Trisha, Trisha was the one who ran after him and go find him and come. And then she come back and say, and she said, Pastor, how you do it? I mean, he's, he's, and you just sit there cool as um, cucumber. I love him and I care for him, but I will not let him ever take the place of God in my life. God gave him to us and we must learn to give them back to God. Because if you don't give them back to God, Satan control you. Children are an heritage of who? The Lord. Unless the Lord builds the house, unless the Lord builds the house, you labor but in vain. If God not keep your family, you can't keep them. You are not omnipresent. Some of you, all your children outside the door, you day in your bed, roll on a toss and can't sleep. Go sleep. Give them to God. Big old 45 year old hairy back man. And uh, I don't know where, where John is. <laughs> I've been trying to call John and I can't get John. Has anyone seen John? John. Um, some people sometimes when they're telling me about their children, and I and I said, um, after they talk and 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 I said, How old is a child? Um He's 40, 40, uh, 49. <laughs> I want to stretch my hand through the phone, sister, sister Cecile, and I want to grab them and shake them. Come on, you are behave like that for a 49-year-old man. But pastor, it doesn't matter how old they get. It's my child. It's my wash belly. In the Bible, they did not do, and I believe even today, where the Jewish people are concerned, if I'm correct, they do not do married, pre-marital counsel. It doesn't exist in Scripture. You know, I'm always going to say something that is going to shock you to your bone. You know why? And if you're truly hearing me and receiving the teaching, and those of you that have young children, you're supposed to prepare your children for that moment. That when the moment comes, they no need no marital, premarital counsel because they have, a, they have been already prepared for it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it said if a father refused to give his virgin, his daughter to marry, he has done well. But if he chooses to do so, he has not committed any sin. Because in Bible days, it was the father's responsibility. Hence we have the term, give away father. God gave away the first female. 
and Eve did not get nine sessions of premarital counsel. And Adam, and, Adam, and Adam did not get any premarital, and they didn't come together for premarital counsel. And God says, you know, marriage is rough, you know, and you're going to have some bumps along the way, Adam. And, you know, you need to learn how to do this and do whatever. Nothing. Because if you notice what the scripture says, a man, when it comes to that moment, shall leave what? Mother and father and do what and what we have not done and we don't care to learn and even give ourselves to it we have not prepared our children to leave and cleave they need to know that as they're growing up that you're not going to be around me all the time and you're being prepared so you're, you're, you're not only preparing them with what you say the way you live it's an example. So when they leave, they know exactly how it is supposed to be done. Emmanuel, if time goes on and he gets to the place where he decides that he wants to get married, he's not supposed to get no marital counsel or premarital counsel. Because every day, I said every day, right in front of him, in his presence, the counsel is in living flesh. Why do you think the Bible said train up your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord? And why do you think it says in Proverbs, train up a child Train up a child in the way that he should go. That when he's old, he will not depart from it. Even in this ministry, none of you were in this ministry for over a month or a year. You should not worry about marital counsel because it's like every meeting God have me if he says something to prepare you. And you still, when you time come, you know, you know, pass how much you think, how many sessions do you think I need? I need a, about a, you know, da, 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 da. If you pay attention to the word and you have the spirit of God in you, you don't need nobody if he tell you. Because some of them with him I tell you, no, no go so. My dear, marriage is rough. But pastor, you rough. For you, rough. For we, my wife and I. There is no roughness. Because God created the institution. God established it to represent Christ and the church. Is the relationship between the church and Christ rough? Bumpy, hostile. Sometimes Jesus is in the house and he not talk to you for months. <laughs> you are, I'm talking about believers and the man come in and him over the side they are cook and the woman over the side they are cook. And the woman over here saw have loud music up play. When trouble in your life, sing praises. <laughs> <laughs> and people counsel you out of their emotions and their rough experiences. You are supposed to counsel people from the word of God if you're going to counsel them. Do I care if you don't want to believe that my wife and I is experiencing the beauty of what the scripture says about Christ and the church? Do I care? I don't care if you want to believe it. And me, I enjoy it. And me, I eat the pudding. And me, I cut the cake. And me, I enjoy it. So you turn over there with your hungry self. And I say, oh, he might go on like him belly full. Me, I have the cake. And you think some of you are going to make you make me not eat my cake? 
Eh, eh, thou preparest a table before me right in the presence of my enemy. Eat where God provides for you. If your enemy drop down and dead, eat until your belly full. Belch and wipe your mouth. Because a lot of you do not believe what I am teaching. You do not believe it. Do I care? I will continue to enjoy it. The Bible says, enjoy the wife of your youth. I may be 50 something, but I'm youthful in my marriage. I'm youthful. I'm not just youthful at heart, I'm youthful everywhere. <laughs> Marriage is given to us from the loving, living God to be enjoyed and show off Christ and the church. Show off Christ and the church. And if you're not ready for it yet, wait. And run down nothing. The Bible even command you that those of you who are not married yet, it's, if you're not married, no seek for it. And if you're in one, no seek for come out. That's why you must make sure that you get into a good one. Because the Bible says you must seek for come out. That once you go in, the door lock. Because the vow is until. Why you think God say I hate divorce in Malachi? Because of what it represents. And if you take it for joke and think you just you just try the one here, try the one there, try the one there, try the one there, try the one there. Some of us we men, you say you are look for a wife. And you are test out the sister them. And after you test and test and test. Where you think they, where you think they are? Where, where you think they are? You are going on a test. You test Judy. You test Camille. No, no man test you. You are tester. You are unique. You are not even a prototype. Because prototype means you are going to have other, others after. You are no prototype. You are uniquely made my God, fearfully and wonderfully, there, is, there are people that look like, look like you, Brother Patrick. But nobody, there is not another like you. The sister in Jamaica, she said, Pastor Marlon, look like you. So when they see you up on the TV, they say, Marlon, look like you, Pastor. But it may look like... <laughs> George Jefferson <laughs> anointing <laughs> but there is only one of me one Patrick, one Marlon there is no multiverse with no double whatever they want to claim nonsense Any of you under my leadership, tutelage, guidance, you say that you are following my leadership. That's why you say a lot of you are saying it, but you're not doing it. You're not going to talk about discipleship. Or you think people are being discipled in Christ? Or you think people are discipled? Huh? And you continue to live a certain way. Do you think I'm going to go to my bed and lose sleep over it? This is a place where people are taught to do what Jesus says. And guess what? The one that is teaching it does not tell you to do what I say and don't do what I do. I am inviting you to do what I say and equally do what I do. Jesus said, the Pharisees, the hypocrites, he said, he said, what they tell you to do, do it, but do not do what they do. Because they tell you to do something right, right? But they don't do it. I don't know why I got over into that rut. 
I'm driving on Eglinton. So I drop down in a one eye patrol from Eglinton. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, I have seen and heard, and I'm talking about in what we call the church, some of the worst, some of the nastiest condition where marriage is concerned. And, and, and especially the men, they, they are so locked up in their flesh, in their carnality, in their ego. That's a French word, right? Ego. It comes from French. You know what it means? They are so locked up in it. And, and guess what? Men, men, watch this. It depends on what culture they come out of, how they will treat you. Because if they are not in Christ, it's their culture that dictate what their paradigm is. So Caribbean men, how do you think we view women? Some of the highest abuse against women is in the Caribbean. Jamaica, even of late, for the last five or ten years or so, my God, almost every domestic incident end up in debt. But the government is grappling, trying to come up with different programs because it is so bad. Soldiers shooting their wife. Police officers shooting their wife. The wife shoot the police up, shoot the man because the woman can't take it no more. And the sad thing is many of them goes to and the man is a... <laughs> Pastor, deacon. You know what God is doing through me? Literally scaring some of you from marriage. That you, you, you think about it hard before you say yes. So, well, me love you too, but <laughs> give me some time. And then the man is skin on the fire. How much time you want? How much time you want? I give you time already. Come on, come on. We, we, let us do it. Because we do all in a Christ. And, and, and come, come on, come on. Da, 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 da. Making, keeping kin under control. And you make sure that you get a personal word from God. Not from your pastor. Your pastor must confirm what you get from God. So now come to me and tell me, say God, say pastor, may I ask you for prayer because I need no box me. You pray first. And so if God take 10 years or 40 years, wait until God answer you. It is that serious. Because too much is going on in the body of Christ, in the church. Too many hurt. And people accept it and think that this is how it's supposed to be. I, I, I am sick and tired of watching even shows and movies. Because the shows and movies are playing out what the culture is. And you see, situation. And they say, oh, you know, certain things going on. And they say, oh, which marriage doesn't have problems? Mine doesn't. Uh, well. Uh, <laughs> well, shabba, 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 shabba. I don't know about that. Because there is no perfect, there is no perfect marriage. So you're telling me, you're telling me that that which is used to equate Christ and the church is not perfect? You're telling me that God chose an imperfect thing to represent his son and the church? The reason why we don't see those perfect marriages in the church. We have subscribed to the wrong source. Yes. 
When you look at my wife and I, it is supposed to give you hope. It is supposed to encourage you. It's supposed to give you something to aspire to. The Bible says that the woman should behave herself in a certain way. And when she behaves herself in that way, she's now considered the daughter of Sarah. He said, even Sarah, the way she conducted herself, this is how woman, godly woman of whole, conducted themselves in a way that the reverence that Sarah gave to Abraham, she literally called him Lord. Not even the pit me them. No, I say nothing. <laughs> because this is, this is an issue. And it's a very dire issue where the church is concerned. Many of you right now in the room, the marriage is, is a, is a, it is nowhere near to represent anything about Christ and the church. And it's the rusty stone, tough back man where I pretend that he knows God is, is correct. And listen to me, woman. You see those like some of you in this room today? That you, you know you are there and you see them. And they have no intention to change. Do not plan to stay in that marriage for another year from now. Walk away. I'm talking it in front of them. Walk away and it's no sin. Because from day one, some of them were not even put in your life by God. You chose him like Israel chose Saul. And God cut off what Israel chose and gave them a man after his own heart. You think it doesn't have anything to do with faith? When your marriage is not working good, it affects every area of your life. Even your faith is under pressure. You go into a house, the environment is tense. You can cut it with a knife, like when you cut cheese. When I go anywhere, it's a joy for me to go back home. And watch this. You see, when my wife is not where I am, I want to be where you are, dwelling in your presence, gazing in your beautiful eyes. Even though the lashes are falling <laughs> in your presence. <laughs> That's where I always want to be. I just want to be with you. When we are in Christ, I have been saying this for years. There ought to be a significant difference. It's okay for the world to have trouble in their marriage. It's okay. Because they're in darkness. They make decisions in darkness. So they're supposed to experience that. But when it comes to being in Christ, we are in the light. We're supposed to make decision in light so you know exactly, you see exactly everything. But yet, we keep making these decisions that end up misrepresenting God. Husbands, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Husbands, Husbands, you're supposed to dwell with your wife according to knowledge and you ought not to be bitter with them. Some man, some of you in the room right now and some of you watch me, you literally bitter with the woman where you stand up. Some of you, me married you and I regret the day that I married some of you. 
And that's what caused me to get to the point right now where I am not quick to marry anybody anymore. I am asking some very serious questions and I need to see some things and I'm discerning. I will not be a part of it. No more. Because I've seen one, two, three, four. You know what? Every single one of them that I married, they may look for me right now. Whether they may watch on TV or they're in the room, ask them. I ask them. And, I, and they don't understand the reason why I asked them. You know. I said, what did God tell you? And a lot of the men, especially the men, they lied. And say, oh God, you know, I prayed about it. And the Lord told me. And the Lord showed me. And the Lord said this. And then later on down the road, you start to behave in a way. So if, if God really told you that that woman is going to be your wife, let me stay here so if I so the Spirit want me to stay until we're done. If God show you that, and listen to me, and you're not behaving the way you're behaving, you are in violation. You are in disobedience to God. Because listen to me, while some of you worthless men blaming your wife for everything that is going on right now and not understanding that you are supposed to take responsibility and everything like Adam, the woman, the woman. You have also a husband when they call me and I talk to my brother Wes, they, they, know, they, they never say, oh, pastor, I want you to help me with this where I am concerned. Oh, I, I, some of them all tell me, you know, before they, before they, some of them reach out to me and they, they want me to counsel them and the wife, hear them, hear what they're saying to me. The reason why I'm reaching out to you, because I want, when you meet with us, I want you to tell her and I want you to let her and her and her and her. I mean, I think so then where, where we had a dopey me to talk to. Because in a, in a relationship, it's not a one-sided thing. It, listen to me. Even if you want to blame the woman, you don't read the Bible. You don't read the Bible. Have you not read that when Adi said it was Evie, God said, so you think, Samia, go give you any break? Because even though the woman was deceived, the man was in disobedience. And you know why? Because of the order. I keep telling these men, Brother Eustace, you hear me? When last thing you rub your jaw? All the time? Show me how you do it. <laughs> she say all the time. All right. A lot of these men, there are men in this room and there are men that are watching online and some of them stop watching now because they're so offended with me. They say that they're not getting any godly counsel from me. <laughs> me say, they say, I am not giving them any godly counsel. You know why? Because a lot of the men, because many of them are not born again and pretending that they're born again. When I counsel them from the word, they don't want that. You know what they want me to do? Take side with them. Whatever they are saying, they want me to agree with them that it is so and gang up on the wife. And I'm saying to some of them, I said, listen to me. Irrespective of your wife being this or doing this or so, da, 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 there is a responsibility that God placed on the man. That's why if, listen to me, if you don't want to carry the responsibility, do not think about Jane. Continue to swing on Tarzan with your cloth around your waist. And go look for rock when you want to do something. And leave Jane alone. But if you're going to touch Jane, there's a responsibility that is activated. Notice, Jesus bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. So ought husband to love their wife. And you say, if some of your husband did truly love your wife the way you should... Your wife would begin to change. 
But you keep focusing on her and not seeing that you are not carrying the responsibility that you should be carrying as a wife, as a husband. Ask my wife. She lived without a man for what? 20 odd years or 30 odd years or whatever. Get married. Never married before. And there was a whole lot of stuff that, as I said some Sundays back, that God is not going to give you a wife that is perfect in everything. Because there is something that he needs to do through you by his grace to show off Christ and the church. So Christ continued to wash the church with what? The water of his word to sanctify the church and make the church. Watch it. Present the church holy unto himself. So there's going to be some things in the wife's life. That's why men, when you go after a woman, make sure you are in a place to carry After today, no premarital counsel. Make sure that you're in a place that God is able to demonstrate his grace through you to carry that woman. If you're not, stay there until. Because if you're weak and things begin to happen and you break down and start behave like a Sissy, arguing with your wife, long drawn out argument, and you always want to have the last word as the man. My God Almighty, man, somebody needs to take off a leather belt and wet in a highland, lick your shot. There's a show that I watched, I don't remember what show name, but the man was abusing the woman and she hoiled the bathroom floor. Huh? <laughs> it was a Tyler Perry movie. I don't remember it now, but I remember that part there. And she put oil upon the floor. And when he come in on him, and she take and she whip him. And I'm try to get up and keep on a slide and she whip him. And say you're in Christ. You need to shut your mouth and stop lying and stop blaspheming the name of God. Because a man of God does not behave the way you're behaving and think the way you're thinking. Marriage is not for your penis. Marriage is not for your vagina. It's for Christ and the church. So if you're not ready to represent Christ and the church, keep your penis tie up. And if you can't control it, tie up, go to the doctor and ask them to snip. <laughs> snip. Not too deep, that, but at least. I'm serious. Yes. Even though you're laughing, I am, se- I am God serious. No joke. No joke. Stop laughing. It- pains and break my heart to see so many sisters that continue to suffer day after day, month after month, week after week. No break. And yet, the man coming at the meeting, in at this meeting, all today, some of them in here, right now in this room. And guess what? They're going to get up and they're going to walk out. And Brother Patrick, the sad thing is, they're not going to repent. Because guess why? You know why, Marlon? Because they think that I am the one that is saying this. It's not God. I need to stop. There is a mysterious passage of scripture in the book of Exodus that many of us have read. And when I bring it up, you're going to recall it. And when I read it the first time, Marlon, It bothered me in the sense of I was trying to figure out why would this thing be? God appeared to Moses and spoke to him at the burning bush while he's in the land that would be Canaan that he would lead the children of Israel to go back to. So when he went back home and then he's leaving to go The scripture said his wife and his two sons were with him. Hear what the scripture says. You read it. 
And I'm sure a lot of you think about it too. But you didn't go anywhere with it. It said, the Lord met him and wanted to kill him. Moses, the one who God not talked to in a dream or vision, face to face. God met him and God wanted to kill him. And watch this. His wife discerned and did something that she should have never done. It's the only time, and that's the only time it ever happened. Because it's not a woman supposed to do it. And because a lot of men right now fail to submit themselves to Christ, they compromise their wife every day. They expose their wife to sickness. They expose their wife to disease. They expose their wife to certain demonic attack. That should have never happened because they are not there as a covering. Because if Christ is not covering you, you can't cover nobody. And if you're in disobedience, Christ cannot cover you. You remember what happened? The Bible said the wife took a sharp piece of stone, circumcised her two sons, and then things change. Have you ever read it? You, what, what did you think about it? It's in Exodus, right? So listen. Why would that happen? It's about a covenant. God is serious about covenant. Marriage is a covenant. God is serious about covenant. What was the covenant? Some of you that don't care to read your Bible, it's Genesis chapter 17. God made a covenant with Abraham. And the sign of the covenant is circumcision for the male, the foreskin of the male. And the purpose of the circumcision was to set a precedent that Christ coming, the flesh would have nothing to do with this conception. Because if you notice, the circumcision is the removing of the flesh. So in Genesis chapter 17, one of the instructions that was given is that whomever is not circumcised shall be cut off from among your people. Who was supposed to circumcise the sons? Moses. Notice who God was after. Not the wife. Men who, who continue to pretend that you're of God and you hate me and you're offended with me. Because Marlon, a lot of men coming in here on a Sunday and they're not receiving from me. Because there is offense from a long time now that they're carrying. And offense continue to pack up on top of one another. Because even today, a lot of them going to leave here offended. And a lot that is watching is going to be offended. And some of them may never come back to watch. And some of them may never come back to the ministry because of the offense. And you say that you're a man of God. You say that you're of God. And you're going to carry the offense. And do not repent. Which part of you have anything to do with God? If you're of God, you even run down to this altar right now. I know altar, but come down to this front. And you say, Pastor, Pastor, I, I refuse to leave out of this room the way I came in here. Pastor, I want to be that man. Pastor, I want to be that husband. I want to. But now you sit there with yourself. That is taking you to hell. And continue to resist the word. And think you're going to get away with it. God was going to kill Moses. And when the woman discerned what's going on. She did something that a wife is not supposed to do. A mother is not supposed to do. A female not supposed to circumcise her sons. And these are grown men in their teens. And the Bible said when she circumcised them, God left. So it shows you that that was the reason why. You cannot be under my leadership and your marriage continue to be a mess. Brother Patrick, Trisha, they're an example. When they met me, there was some things and some things and some things and some things and some things. But today, 
Wow. Watch. Sometimes you see all both of them go up and a read. So beautiful. And, 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 you, and you sense that that is not, that is not a pretense. It's real. Yes. While some of them are talking about we need to disciple people, there's some people in this room that I can call out. OJ. When OJ come to the faith and after OJ all married, there were a few times, not a lot of time, but there was a few times, man, when OJ reached out to me, man, because there were some things with Don. You know, I squeeze Don and nothing and come out. <laughs> <laughs> Bless you. You're welcome. And I, there was a occasion that one time I think I met with them. There are times when I would talk to them on the phone and stuff like that. And today, I've watched, I've watched them grown. I have watched them grown. And I see uh, such growth taking place, even in OJ life. When you look from the time where you come to now, wow. I don't know if Megan and Michael is here today. They're not, but they're watching. Hi, Michael. Hi, Megan. I remember when I met them. And I, I think their marriage was even young, you know, and stuff like that. And there was a couple of times, even my wife and I would go to their house at that time. They were living in Brampton. And we sit down and we talk with them and we pray with them. And my God, I have watched Michael and Megan. I've seen a, not a 180. I've seen a 360 degree transformation and turn around. So, so listen to me, you men that don't want God and pretend that you want God, you're excused and even if you want to be offended, you're too late. There is evidence, 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 evidence. There is a case law. Because in the court, when they're doing a case, they go back and look at previous cases that on how this justice so-and-so dealt with it or how whatever so-and-so and what was the verdict and what was handed down and they use that as a precedent to determine how this case will play out so listen to me you're in court today and you're weighed in the balance and you're found wanting. You don't have to leave here the way you came in here. There are testimonies. The, 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 this, this is one of the cases that has been tried and proven that marriage can work. Yeah. Don, yes. when OJ squeezed you now. <laughs> you notice? He's OJ. So when Emmanuel heard his name the first time, Emmanuel said, why are you, why, why are you called OJ? Are you orange juice? <laughs> Don and OJ. Hmm? Not OJ Simpson. In dead? Oh, he gone. Oh. That's OJ, a son of God. Michael and Megan, and there are others that I can pull out to show you that when somebody opened themselves to submit themselves to the word, it works. And God is not using me to entertain you. He's using me to equip you to be the husband that represents the church perfectly, to be the wife that represents the church perfectly, Christ and the church, Christ and the church. 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 My brother, you're a potential husband. And my God, I know that from the time you came into this ministry, there God has been shifting and rearranging and doing some things in your life. And as you move forward, 
when that moment come for you to be a husband to a woman to a wife you will carry the grace of Christ you will carry the order of Christ you will be the husband that God has purpose and destined for you to be and show off Christ and the church show off Christ and the church Father, thank you for what you're doing in this room even right now. And Father, I thank you for who you are and I thank you for your plans and your purposes. And there is nothing that you do that is imperfect. There is nothing that you do that is incomplete. What you do, it is perfectly done. And Father, when you instituted marriage in the beginning... You intended, we didn't see it, we didn't see it in the Old Testament. But when we come to the New Testament, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we know that it is meant to represent Christ and the church. And Father, we have been inundated with the world standard. We have seen so many things. We have seen it on television. We have heard it all over the place. And Father, we have been deceived to think that this is the norm. But Father, that's the abnormal version of it. The normal version, it must look like Christ. Christ and the church, where the husband is loving the wife, laying down his life for the wife, being the head, being the covering, and Christ being his head. And the wife comes under the covering and experience the beauty and the benefit of Christ being the head of the church. So Father, I thank you that there is restoration taking place in this marriage right now. I thank you that there is a new order, a new season, a new day. Oh my God, I give them to you. I commit them to you. I cut them free from every tradition, from every culture that they come from. And that the culture that they're now given over to is the culture of the kingdom of heaven. Not the culture of Trinidad and Tobago, but the culture of the kingdom of heaven. Not the culture of the Caribbean, but the culture of the kingdom of heaven. I break every curse. I break every cycle. My brother, you are in Christ. My brother, you are in Christ. Cycles are broken. Don't you be afraid. Don't you be afraid. Cycles are broken. Curses are broken. It is lifted. You will be. You will be. You are being molded. And as you go forward, Father, I thank you that you are preparing him. I thank you that you are preparing him. I thank you that you are preparing him. And Father, when that moment comes, when you release him and you bless him and seal it for him to be that husband, Father, he will be as Christ is, representing the church the divine order, the divine standard. And Father, as I lay my hands upon him, what's on me, I release on him. What's on me, I release on him. What's on me, I release on him. He will carry it. He will be, Father, even in his family, even right now in his present family. He will be the man. He will be the priest. He will be the prophet. He will be the king. He will be the model. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, Jesus, I thank you for what you're doing in his life right now, right now, right now. Thank you, Father. Watch him. Bring that mic, please. Say, say what the Spirit is saying. There were two scriptures, two passages of scriptures that were read this morning. Revelation 2, Revelation 3. In sections of the two ch chapters, there were passages, verses that says... He was an ear to hear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. We are the church gathered in this room. Another has the Holy Spirit redirected pastor. 
in the area that he went. The Holy Spirit is saying that there's some couples here. There's some husbands here that need to adhere to the word. Forget about, oh mighty God. Forget about how it may look. Forget about what people may think. Stop oh mighty God. The Holy Spirit showed me, even before anyone God. came down here, the Holy Spirit showed me a brother holding the hand of his wife and coming down here, making a fresh commitment. Yeah. Oh, Father, Thank he you, who haven't here to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying right in this moment. Right in this moment, forget about what it may look like, forget about what people may think or say. This may be the moment to save your marriage. Sir, God bless you. God bless you. It takes a true man of God, a man that is after God's heart. Because when you're after God, pride does not dictate to you. Self does not dictate to you. What you do today, coming down here with your wife, I am decreeing and declaring that there is a divine shift that is taking place in your life, your marriage, your family. This day, from this day forward, from this day forward, the f what's the, is it the 14th? The 14th day of April, 2024. Father, they are yours. Show off yourself. And Father, everything that culture has handed to them that is not in alignment with your word, they are relinquishing it today. They are cutting themselves free from it. And Father, whatever has run in their generation, in their family lineage on both sides, they are relinquishing themselves from it that is not of you. And they're giving you freedom for you to bring healing and restoration and beauty and glory and praise. Father, thank you for what you're doing in their life that when they walk away from this spot there is a divine shift that they are now stepping into so be it 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 so be it, so be it. it is possible it is possible it is possible. With God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. And what is impossible to men with God? It is possible. You may have never seen it before. But even when you hear it, it's hard for you to believe it. But with God, all things are possible. Father, thank you for what you're doing in his life at this moment. Thank you for what you're doing. Father, you are destroying. You are rooting up. You are pulling down. You are throwing down whatever you did not plant in the name of the Lord Jesus the Christ. Woo! <laughs> Brothers that are potentially husbands, God is preparing you 
God is preparing you. God is preparing you. Makarabo shetere sataya baba. And just as God told Moses to choose 70 of the elders, and he said, Moses, I am going to take the spirit that is on you, and I'm going to rest it upon them, that they're going to be a part of carrying the burden, the responsibility of you taking care of my people. That same principle applies in this moment. That as I lay my hands on you, that grace that God has placed on my life for me to be the husband that I have been to my wife, it can come on you. It can be transferred. It is tangible and it can be transferred. Receive it, my brother, and carry it. Carry it. You will not carry the curse of your father. You will not carry the curse of your mother. You will not carry the curse of your auntie or your uncle. You will not carry the curse of the culture of Jamaica. You will not carry the curse of the Caribbean. You will carry the culture of the kingdom of heaven. You will carry the grace of your Lord. My grace is sufficient, he says. Ah, so when you are weak in yourself, then you are strong. Because God, whatever he has ordained and established... He graces you to carry, to carry it and to show him off. 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 off. And that cycle that some of us have been a part of, it needs to come to an end today. We are breaking it. And we are destroying it to the point, Sister Jackie, that it will never be able to ever form a cycle again. Never. We need to understand the power of you being translated from the kingdom of darkness and being brought into the kingdom of God's dear son. There's a curse in cultures That many people, it has become a norm that they don't see it as a curse. That it is acceptable for these things to be. But not in the kingdom of God. Not in the kingdom of God. Stand with me please. If you can. It's time... For wives to experience a man who is perfectly submitted to Christ. Enough is enough. You don't need a man just for the sake of a man. If that's the case, then by God, all, by all means, go to go pick up one anyway. But if you're in Christ... It's a moment where you're saying that I am giving myself to be what the word of God says. Because the scripture, whatever the scripture says, it's supposed to become flesh. The word becoming flesh did not start with Christ, with Jesus Christ, and it did not end with Jesus Christ. The first person that represented the word becoming flesh was the first Adam that was made. What did God say before he formed him? Come, let us make man. God did what before it actually manifested. He spoke it. It must continue. So if the scripture says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church, then hear me today. It can become flesh. It can become flesh. It can become flesh. And therefore, every cycle, we have seen things in our, even in our own family. Some of us, we see in our family, divorce, divorce become a part of the culture within our family. That it's a norm. That you're not expecting anything. That even when it happens, they say, well, that's what happened in our family. Not in the kingdom of God. Not in the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. 
So now you know that the Spirit, that's confirmation upon confirmation. So all you have to do, brother, is just open yourself up to that and receive that. And when you're even, even walking out of here today, things cannot remain the same. Father, thank you for what you are doing in my brother's life. My God, I have seen the transformation and I know that you are not finished. I know that you are not finished. And I know that you who have begun a good work, you who have begun a good work in him, you are not going to stop. You are not going to stop until it is completed. So Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I commend him to your word. I commend him to your spirit. Spirit, I commend him to your grace. I commend him to your grace. And Father, he must, he must, he will be that man, that husband, that father. Exactly what you said that he's supposed to be. Nothing less. Nothing less. Nothing less. Nothing less. So be it, Father. So be it. 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 You see, after today, some of you men that are watching online, and some of you men in this room, you say, after today, if you walk out of this room after the word that the Lord send and continue down the path that you have been up until this morning, God help you. God cannot help you after you hear his word and reject it. My wife said, if you notice, she said that the scriptures that were read this morning, certain parts in there, you hear where it says. But notice, every single one of the letter, it ends saying, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the? Not what Bobby Somers, what the Spirit is saying to the church. And a lot of you we are pretend that I am your pastor. I know you. I know you because you do not believe that I am a man of God. You think that I, I plan all that came out of me today. Because notice, notice the part that I was going. And the Holy Spirit just switch. So, 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 notice. so some of them in the room right now, they are there saying, oh, you know, pastor, pastor. And there's conversation out there with a lot of them about me. And even when they come in here, as I said, they're not receiving because they come inside here with offense. And then call yourself a man of God. Come on, you are worthless. You, it's a worthless man that gives Satan room to do what he's doing in your life. Worthless. When you are of God, you, you, you look for opportunity to gang up on the devil and boss him head. But you're going to walk out here today with offense on top of what you came in here with. And a lot of them, they stopped receiving from me many years ago. They came over from Advance to Midway to Arbiter and Square One. And they're not listening to me. I am not their pastor. Pastor to them. It's the culture that we get to where we grew up in in the Caribbean and in the world where as soon as a person, you know, whatever is the leader of a church or the preacher, whatever, everybody call them pastor. Haven't I told you that I do not want you to call me pastor if I am not your pastor? Because if I am your pastor, it means that you submit to the order of God and you receive. You receive whatever the Spirit is saying through you. You don't come in and get offended and puff up yourself and both pastor. And then you go and have argument and conversation with phone and meet up with others and a talk about me and a tear me down. You will be exposed. And the exposing start already. And continue to treat your wife ungodly. You're going to be judged and you're going to be exposed.
And if you do not stop abusing your wife, because some of you are not abusing them physically, but you continue to abuse them in your mind, you continue to abuse them in your conversation, you, if you don't, God is going to expose you. Because Peter warned you that if you're not treating your wife rightly, even your prayers are ended. First Peter chapter 3. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for your word. It's not mine. You, Father, I don't write out sermons, you know. And I'm not even against those who want to write it, but they better make sure they write exactly what the Spirit is saying and it's not something they make up. But Father, I give myself to you anytime, anywhere for you to speak through me. And Lord, I give you all the glory for those who have submitted themselves to the order of you in my life. And Lord, I thank you for preparing a people not just for even marriage, but for the return of your son. Because, Father, if our marriage is not working right, how are we preparing for the return of the bridegroom that is coming back to receive the church unto himself? So, Lord, I thank you for healing. I thank you for restoration. I thank you that men that were struggling and think that it cannot work, that today they're walking out of this room knowing that it is 100% possible for it to be, for it to be, for it to be exactly what your word says. Thank you, Lord, that the word is taking on flesh, flesh in this room, and beyond this room. And whatever else, we give ourselves to your word and to your spirit to continue to work in us and through us to show off who you really are to the world that is in darkness and needs hope. The world around us, Father, marriages is like clothing. As a matter of fact, they treat clothing even with more value than how they treat marriages. And Father, such things should never come near those of us that are in the church. And Lord, when we look at the scripture, we see Abraham became the father of our faith. And how Abraham treated Sarah, Sarah called him Lord. Father, we see even Jacob, that he started out rough, but when he met you, you changed his name from Jacob to Israel, and he became a pattern. And Father, we see it with Isaac. We see it all throughout the scriptures. We see it. We see it. We see it. And Father, your word tells us why this thing is established, that it's not about social status. It's not about me showing that I too can be this. It's about showing off Christ and the church. And Father, we see the things that your son says about it. We see what you have used the apostle to say about it. May the word become flesh in our lives again and again and again. In Christ's name I pray and tell you thanks. Amen. Amen. Pardon me?